10, 9, Cigarettes and rocket fuel. Suck it to me, five, baby. 4, 3, 2, We choose to go to the moon. Zero. All engines running. Commit. We choose to go to the lift moon. Off. We have liftoff at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Oh, I'm here. Let's go all the way. Everything looks good. Roger. All right, copy. KHCN AM 4747, Houston, Texas. News you can use and talk that matters. Say it with me, gents. Leisure jacket. Now say suede lavished. Grand tour leisure jacket. A genuine suede leather everywhere. Stitched on pockets and framed collar. Outlining pocket flaps covering buttonholes. This fully lined combed cotton is perfect weight for now and right through the spring and summer. Oyster white or brandy tan sizes 36 to 46, just $19.95. An elegant import from Austria, available only at Bonds, America's largest clothier. Downtown, Gulfgate Mall, Northline Shopping Center, Sharpstown Center, Memorial City. Open Monday, Thursday, Friday till 9 p.m. Today is Sunday, March 16th, 1969. The Tim's timepiece is time at the tone is 2 p.m. If your timepiece is right only twice a day, get down to Tim's timepieces in Rice Village. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Steve Schaefer with a recap of this week's news you can use. Topping the events of the past week, James Earl Ray received a 99-year sentence after pleading guilty in Tennessee to the murder of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Ray, who assassinated the civil rights leader with one rifle shot in Memphis on April 4th of last year, entered the plea on Monday, his 41st birthday, to forego a jury trial. Had he been found guilty in a jury trial, Ray would have been eligible for the death penalty. Shellings of Allied bases and nearby Vietnamese towns grew especially heavy Friday as the Viet Cong continued a spring offensive now in its third week, prompting President Richard Nixon to issue a warning that the United States might retaliate. And we have reports that rockets hit Saigon today, although they are said to have caused relatively little damage. On Thursday, the U.S. command reported that 789 American troops had been killed during the first 14 days of the offensive. The tally included 20-year-old Army Private First Class Roger Smelzer of Baytown, who entered the service seven months ago. In other news involving the president, it's reported that Mr. Nixon might face serious opposition in Congress after approving a missile defense program aimed at protecting U.S. land-based forces from air attacks. The system, dubbed Safeguard, comes with a price tag estimated at $6 billion to $7 billion. Closer to home, Mayor Louis Welch acknowledged his investment in eight Houston properties, although he has yet to reveal the extent of those investments. Most of them were made last year, and critics fear those properties might unduly affect decisions made by the third-term mayor. The Houston School Board has agreed to restore 4,000 lunches for poor children, Saying its lunchroom department was running a deficit, the board had removed the meals from its program earlier this month. Approximately 300 picketers protested those cuts before the school board voted on the matter this past week. To offset the cost of feeding the children, the board also voted to reduce teaching staff during summer school. The Beatles are down to one bachelor, though that might not be the case for long. 26-year-old Paul McCartney got married on Wednesday to Linda Eastman in a quiet civil ceremony in London. The marriage is the second for the 27-year-old Eastman, a photographer who has taken the picture of many a rock musician. Meanwhile, the divorced John Lennon, who in 1962 became the first Beatle to marry, is said to be close to tying the knot again. As for the other Beatles, Ringo Starr has been married since 1965 and George Harrison since 1966. Incidentally, none of McCartney's bandmates were at his wedding, perhaps lending credence to talk that there is friction within the band. Finally, one more musical note. Port Arthur native Janis Joplin, who graces the cover of this week's Rolling Stone magazine, will appear on tonight's Ed Sullivan Show. The 26-year-old vocalist has been pursuing a solo career since leaving the group Big Brother and the Holding Company last year. Coming up next, Alex Stuckey and Andrew Dansby review an exciting week in the race to the moon, which saw Apollo 9 splash down after a successful mission for KHCN. I'm Steve Schaefer. You are listening to KHCN AM 4747, Houston, Texas. Thanks, Steve, and hello, Andy. Wow, what a week. I'm exhausted. So much Apollo news, I don't know where to start. Let's say we start at the end of the story. Today, those three Apollo 9 astronauts... McDivitt, Scott, and Schweigert. Yes, those three astronauts 
are home in Houston, safe and sound, and have been sleeping in their own beds since Friday. It's always great to see families reunited at Ellington, all those kids, hugs and kisses all around. It's a great scene, Alex. I was out there covering for the station, darn near froze. The plane was an hour late. They said they had a headwind all the way. But when they finally touched down, folks were ecstatic. I don't think that overstates the situation. Ecstatic, as anyone would be, of course. The wives put on a brave face all week. Ten days. Well, always. But they sure looked extra happy to see their husbands home safe. Before the launch and all during the mission, they expressed complete confidence in NASA and their husbands. But they all looked relieved as they watched that perfect splashdown on TV Thursday. First time the capsule stayed right side up after it hit the water. The divers got the hatch open fast. The whole recovery operation was slick. Back to the wives for just a sec. Mrs. McDivitt, Patricia, said she knew exactly which man was hers in that life raft because he has the most hair on his face and the least on his head. He was also wearing a big smile and waving at the television camera. They all were. And Scott said she was never worried, just normally concerned, she claimed. I bet. Those gals are team players. All of them. Claire Schweikert was the rookie on this mission. She had a little more to think about with her Russell feeling the side effects of space travel. She admitted to being worried the first five days, but then she said she just couldn't worry anymore. She was grateful that NASA officials kept her completely informed after her husband got sick on the third day. She probably knew more about his condition than anyone. NASA brass was tight-lipped about Schweikert's condition, you'll recall. Don't go away, folks. Next up, we're going to talk about how a perfect re-entry led to that pretty splashdown. Be right back. And for the ladies, swing into spring with pants, pants, pants. $5.99 and $6.99. The wider they are, the softer they fall. Choose from our big selection of cotton prints in the wildest geometric and flower power prints in sizes for all. Only at Three Sisters, 719 Main, Downtown, and also Palm Center. You are listening to KHCN AM 4747 Houston, Texas. News you can use and talk that matters. Apollo 9 reentry demands 36 minutes of precision. That was the headline in the paper Thursday, and that's just the way it turned out. Amen. After we talk through those 36 minutes, we're going to have a guest by telephone from the East Coast. Houston Post reporter Tommy West covered the entire recovery operation aboard the USS Guadalcanal. But before we bring in Mr. West, let's set it up. The opening paragraph of that story, well, here it is. The final 36 minutes of Apollo 9 must occur with precision, or hardly anyone will remember anything else about the flight. Wow. And keep in mind that Apollo 9 had already aced the most difficult and most dangerous Apollo mission yet. Y'all know that Apollo 9 was scheduled for 150 trips around the Earth and ended up doing 151. And here's why. Andy? The weather. The intended splashdown target was southeast of Bermuda. But the wind was up and so were the waves, head high. That kind of chop is risky, so they relocated the target 400-some miles to the southwest of the original spot off Grand Turk Island, 300 miles north of Puerto Rico, where conditions look better. Prime recovery ship, the helicopter carrier USS Guadalcanal, was 16 hours from the new splashdown site, but she made it there in plenty of time. When Mission Control asked the crew if they wouldn't mind going around one more time, they jumped at the chance. McDivitt said, I want those recovery guys to find a nice, soft piece of water with no wind, no waves, and lots of sunshine. They went around one more time and... The sequence begins 36 minutes out when the spacecraft is at its highest point, in orbit, off Hawaii. They have to put on the brakes. Brakes? They break the spacecraft out of orbit by firing the surface propulsion system in a forward direction for just over 11 seconds. They do this at exactly 10.31 a.m. Houston time. The slows... Brakes. Gotcha. Fun fact, y'all. Rockets don't have brakes. <laughs> <laughs> so, this braking, the SPS produces some 20,000 pounds of thrust, slows the ship and increases its attractiveness to the Earth's gravity. For sake of comparison, at the start of this mission, at liftoff... The engines of the Saturn V produce more than 7 million pounds of thrust. So the firing of the SPS is just a tap on the brakes, if you will. Okay, I'm picturing it. The command module and the service module are still together, slowing down. Still not slow. Zipping right along, really. Hawaii to Puerto Rico in 28, 29 minutes? After the retrograde burn, both modules are still connected for about five minutes. Then, the surface module is separated, tumbles away, and burns up in the atmosphere as it drops toward Earth. If the SPS fails, 
There's a manual backup system. The MBS? Nope. The reaction control system, the RCS. They didn't need it, so we won't get into it. But let's just say if the RCS had been needed, the spaceship would have gone around the Earth two more times, and the splashdown would have been in the Pacific. Those NASA engineers think of everything. From here on, the rest of the trip is automated. At 10.44 a.m., the process of reentry begins from 400,000 feet over the Fort Worth, Dallas area. Two and a half minutes later, the crew starts feeling gravity, then more gravity, and then still more pull. Eventually, the pull of gravity is intense, 3.4 times what we feel on Earth. Wow, have you been to Astroworld yet? That coaster, that was a lot of Gs. If the Texas Cyclone had a flaming plasma shield growing bigger and bigger around it as it screams along, dropping to Earth at thousands of miles per hour, 70 miles up in the air, then the Texas Cyclone might be getting close to the Apollo ride. So intense. Point taken, Andy. The heat and flames finally cut off communication. It's a total blackout for three minutes something. Then the forward heat shield is popped off, still at 24,000 feet, about 4.5 miles up. It's 10.55 a.m. Then boom, the crew gets jerked back as two drogue parachutes pop out. The drogues slow the drop from 300 miles an hour to about 175. At 10,000 feet, the drogues pull away, and the three main chutes... Blossom? I suppose they blossom, and then the three huge main parachutes slow the descent from 175 to 22 miles per hour, and it takes another five minutes before the capsule touches the water. Wow. Great job, Andy. While you're listening to this important message, we'll be getting Tommy West fresh off recovery ship the USS Guadalcanal on the horn to help us tell the rest of the Apollo 9 story. Get down to downtown Jacoby Pearson Lincoln Mercury, 1320 Louisiana. See Mercury's fabulous top of the line, brand new 69 marquee. Anything you could possibly want at a price you can afford. 429 cubic inch V8, automatic transmission, white wall tires, power front disc brakes, effortless power steering, interval wipers, AM radio, and D. Lux wheel covers. How much? Only $38.95. Just for you, $38.95, and you are in for the ride of your life. Hello, Mr. West. Hello, Houston. Andy Dansby here, Tommy. Thanks for joining us. Happy to talk to you, Houston folks. We've been discussing the return of Apollo 9, the crew arrival here at Ellington after the really flawless re-entry, the tail end of which you witnessed aboard the Guadalcanal. Before we went to break, we had the capsule floating down on three big parachutes just touching the water. So great to have an eyewitness on the show. What'd you see from your vantage point? It was truly magnificent. I can tell you that the officers and the crew of the Guadalcanal are all proud of the historic role they got to play in the Apollo program. Of course, the ship was in contact with the capsule after communications were restored. Splashdown was eventually made 4.5 nautical miles from the ship. Not the closest splashdown ever, but the sea is big, and that's close enough to be considered pinpoint. I mean, on the money. So, you had a good view. Certainly. The ship closed that distance quickly. The helicopters were on the spot, and the primary recovery chopper escorted the capsule, which was sort of swaying under those orange and white striped parachutes as it settled into the water. Not much of a splash at all, really. After the ship moved in, we had a front row seat. From the television, and I've got to say it's thrilling to be able to watch it live, now, and up close. Hats off to the networks. It's impressive what they can do these days. The recovery operation was very smooth, even if the crew ended up soaking wet and looking a bit wobbly on those inflatable life rafts going up and down in the waves, the helicopter kicking up spray. Yes, sir. The helicopter dropped rescue divers and the rafts. The capsule was upright this time, so there was no need for flotation bags to get her right side up. Once they got the hatch open, the guys crawled out, looking just a little unsure of their legs, but real happy just the same. Dave Scott came out first, then Schweikert. He ended up in the drink for a second, but he quickly pulled himself up and tumbled into the raft. Commander Jim McDivitt was last. Eventually, they were all hauled up one by one to the chopper. That part seemed a little dicey. The frogmen had trouble grabbing the basket. A couple of the guys got dipped in the water before they were reeled up, but nobody seemed to mind. Three waterlogged, rubber-legged astronauts, as Mr. Cronkite called them. McDivitt admitted as much in brief remarks before they went for a debrief and medical checks. Said he didn't have his sea legs, or his land legs. He's a humble man, saying... I just hope we accomplish something worthwhile. History will surely be a favorable judge of that. They all looked happy, but kind of thin. I hope they had a big piece of that 350-pound victory cake the Guadalcanal baked for them. The only hitch, or drama, if you want to call it that, 
was a package of apparently time-sensitive samples that somehow missed getting off the ship with the astronauts. A C-130 made a couple passes over the ship, trying to hook it, but that didn't work out, and they ran out of daylight, so they scrubbed it. One other bit of drama, maybe, President Nixon sent a telegram of congratulations. That's the first time the president has not immediately called the crew after recovery. I'm not sure what to make of the politics of that. But the astronauts and their families have been invited to a White House dinner with the president and the first lady in a couple weeks. Otherwise... Otherwise, it's back to Houston for me. We'll be following the debrief. I'm interested in seeing the photographs they took from space, infrared and such. They spent a good bit of time on that work, the last four or five days. Some interesting and valuable science will come out of that, they say. NASA likes to squeeze a lot of value out of the mission when they send three men up on a Saturn V. Many thanks, Tommy. Get some rest. We've been talking to Houston Post reporter Tommy West, who's returned from aboard the USS Guadalcanal. We hope to have him back as these Apollo moon missions continue. We're overdue for a break. This message is extra special, folks, and not just because I recorded it. It's about United States savings bonds. Pile up credits for your future. Stack them in the form of United States savings bonds. Bonds are better than ever and are now paying four and one quarter percent when held to maturity. And when you buy bonds, either over the counter at your bank or right through the automatic payroll savings or bond a month plans, buy your bonds in the new 5% freedom shares in combination. Credit your future and Uncle Sam's too with higher paying savings bonds and freedom shares. I recently heard that they've started selling savings bonds to the Russians. In the first day, over 75% of them are gone. So be sure and get your bonds now before all the red commies get them. You are listening to KHCNAM 4747, Houston, Texas. News you can use and talk that matters. We do not have to wait for history to pass judgment on the work done by the crew of Apollo 9 and all the scientists, engineers, technicians, sailors, and cake bakers who supported them. Lieutenant General Sam Phillips, head of the Apollo program, has hailed the mission as imminently successful, and today we'll just accept his word on that. He said, The purpose was to get the lunar module into manned flight and to demonstrate it alone and in conjunction with the command module in the separate and joint maneuvers they have to accomplish. Like Tommy West, General Phillips is also excited about the pictures the crew has taken. Phillips here. In Apollo, we have had to concentrate on getting to the manned lunar landing. We haven't had a chance, with rare exceptions, to contribute very much to the scientific interests. Here at KHCN, we hope Congress, in upcoming budget talks, considers all the scientific contributions made by the Apollo program. NASA has discussed going ahead with the moon landing during Apollo 10, but General Phillips has all but ruled out the moon landing for the next flight. Apollo 10 is already on the Kennedy Space Center pad being prepped for a May 17 launch. We're looking forward to it. Please stay tuned for Space City Social with Miss Amber, and then Steve Schaefer will be checking in with Sunday Afternoon Sports. Until next week, folks, God bless. Welcome to Space City Social. I'm Miss Amber, and here's the scoop. While Mrs. Strake was in the hospital, her husband, Mr. George W. Strake, had a notable lady on each arm at his Strake Jesuit Scholarship Fund benefit. Who exactly were his special guests? None other than Pat White and Mrs. James A. McDivitt. Mr. Jim McDivitt, the astronaut, is a little tied up. He's orbiting the Earth on day seven of a 10-day Apollo flight. Pat, of course, is the widow of fallen astronaut Ed White. Both women whirled around the Emerald Room of the Shamrock Hilton for the occasion. Astronauts James Lovell, William Anders, and Frank Borman were other familiar faces in the star-studded crowd. In Washington, First Lady Pat Nixon spent a special matinee of the Ringling Brothers in Barnum and Bailey Circus with 6,300 underprivileged children. Reportedly, she also got caught with a mouthful of cotton candy. Across the pond in London, Judy Garland announced she will marry disco dancer Mickey Deems at a registrar's office on Saturday. This will be Miss Garland's fifth marriage. We wish them luck. In happier news, Elizabeth Taylor's husband, Richard Burton, sent a violinist to her bedside while the actress is recovering from a degenerating spinal disc in a Hollywood hospital. The happy couple has a Puerto Vallarta vacation on the books for next week. Barbara Streisand's Funny Girl, Franco Zeffirelli's Romeo and Juliet, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang starring Dick Van Dyke, and Bullet starring Steve McQueen are all playing in a theater near you. According to Foley's, 
Purple is the color of 1969. Dress up your man in a tie or blazer in the popular shade from any of your nearby Foley's department stores. Let's talk next week. You've been listening to KHCN AM. We thank you for your kindness. We hope you enjoy your Sunday afternoons with Alex, Andy, and the rest of the Space Talk crew. This is Steve Schaefer with your Sunday afternoon sports scoreboard. If your timepiece is right only twice a day, get down to Tim's Timepieces in Rice Village. The Tim's Timepieces time at the tone is... Need more junk in your life, space nerd? We mean junk and nerd in the best possible way. Space junk, ya nerd. Sign up for the Space Junk newsletter at HoustonChronicle.com slash Space Junk. Roger that. Want to know more about Apollo and the moon landing? Mission Moon is a look back at how NASA shaped the world and Houston. Get all the special features at HoustonChronicle.com slash Mission Moon. Houston Chronicle reporters Alex Stuckey and Andrew Dansby are Alex and Andy. Making his debut this week as Houston Post reporter Tommy West is Chronicle reporter Julian Gill. Mr. West was a real reporter back in the day, and he really was aboard the USS Guadalcanal. Steve Schaefer is the newsman. He's also a singer in a rock and roll band, but that's a story for another day. Chronicle Society writer Amber Elliott is Miss Amber. Staff graphic artist Ken Ellis performs most of the ads. In this episode, Chronicle technology writer Dwight Silverman tried to sell you a brand new 1969 Lincoln Mercury for the price of a decent laptop. Fun fact, those newfangled interval windshield wipers he mentioned were first patented in 1967. The ads are not real. They were in 1969. Most of them ran in the newspaper, but that was like 50 years ago, you dig? Radio station KHCN AM 4747 exists only in your mind. This week, our station IDs are voiced by our race, gender, and religion writer, Lisa Gray, theater critic and cultural writer, Wei Wan Chen, and by a proud graduate of Space Center Intermediate in Clear Creek ISD, Jennifer Chang, who grew up to become the Chronicle's Director of Digital Audiences. Leela Merrill handles our show notes pages, HoustonChronicle.com slash Apollo Podcast. The Chronicle's archivist and researcher is Joyce Lee. Scott Kingsley is the creator and producer. Cigarettes and Rocket Fuel is a history podcast, and we in no way intend to glamorize the use of cigarettes any more than we condone the sexism and racism that existed in society and in the newspaper pages in 1969. We hope cigarettes, sexism, and racism all become history one day. I'm Joy Sewing. I write about beauty, fashion, and fitness for The Chronicle. Last year, I wrote a children's book, Ava and the Prince, The Adventures of Two Rescue Pups. And last month, I met Oprah Winfrey. How do you like me now? Susan Barber designed my book. Susan also designed the Cigarettes and Rocket Fuel logo. Speaking of, would you like a logo sticker? Then send a self-addressed stamped envelope, Millennials, Ask Your Mom and Dad How, to Cigarettes and Rocket Fuel, Houston Chronicle, 4747 Southwest Freeway, Houston, Texas, 77027. You love this podcast. Share the love. Tell a friend. We'll send you a sticker. You deserve something special. Crayola Girl was created by Farrell Gibbs and produced by Brent Busby. Until next week, peace and love, y'all.
shine.